Welcome to Codex. I'm Mike Coletta. And I'm Tyler Osby. And today, Tyler's surprising me. I can't believe we haven't done this before. It's crazy we haven't done this before. I'm 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 continually surprised with how many episodes we haven't done before, considering we're at episode 264. Also, I'm sometimes surprised by episodes we have done because I'll have a great idea for an episode and then I'll do a quick search and realize we've already done that. Especially uh, last week when we, we did Resident Evil twice. I was yeah. like, oh no, we can't do that. I want to do that again. You know, Resident Evil is such a popular series, though. I feel like we came back to it. You know, yeah, it's fine. No, I, this this is important. This is I think we one. put a good spin on it last week. I'm not I'm not down I'm oh, not yeah. trying to talk down about our uh, our second our revisit to Resident Evil. Um, I'm just trying to talk that you didn't know we had already done Resident Evil. <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to talk myself out of being embarrassed about it still. So, <laughs> well, today we're talking Spyro the Dragon. Yes. The ma mascot platformer of the PlayStation. Do you have a lot of experience with Spyro the Dragon, Mike? With the demo. Oh, tell me more. I love so, people's like demo stories. Of, so of, like, I played the demo disc for this all the time, but you would get to a certain spot and it would just stop. Mm -hmm. So I probably played through the demo like two or three times as a kid. I loved it. I thought it was a great. It's a it's a cute dragon. What's that to love? Yeah. Was it was it like a PlayStation Underground demo? Mm -hmm. It was like and a demo. Had... You'd get in like a magazine. You'd get it in like yeah. an electronic gaming monthly or something like that. Yeah. They also had, a, a, I think, I want to say Crash 2 or 3 also had a demo for Spyro, the first Spyro game. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other way around as well. I think uh, whatever Spyro game was the demo on that Crash game, the, the Spyro game had the demo for the same Crash game. Yeah, that's right. Work, Naughty Dog and, and uh, Insomniac work like across the hall from each other at the time. Maybe they still do, but at the time they did. So that's why they had them on there. Well, yeah. I'm happy it's a part of my demo disc. So I've never played the full game. I should say that. Okay. Never done that. But I did play the demo. Okay. I played that first level a lot. Yeah. A lot. <laughs> it goes on sale a lot on uh, like the Reignited trilogy on Steam, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, that goes on sale all the time. It's uh, worth picking up, I think. So it's We're just, we're talking about Spider Dragon 1 today. Correct. Yeah, just pretty one. much. I mean, we'll we'll talk a little bit about two and three. They're kind of just more the same in a very good way. Like they're just the same thing, but like more and bigger and expanded and like, you know, they're they're great. Uh, we don't get into at all the later stuff. Um, I just kind of want to talk about Spyro and and his place in the the mascot platformer uh, era of games when every system had to have like their mascot. You know, which mm -hmm. isn't as much the case anymore. But in the '90s, that was like. That was the thing, right? Platformers were this huge genre. They were made popular by the transcendent Super Mario Brothers on the NES uh, in the mid-80s, right? And there were other platformers that existed before Super Mario Brothers. I'm not trying to say this was the first one. Um, but can you name any that were before Super Mario Brothers? I mean, Qbert? Was Qbert uh, before? I mean, Jaybird? Oh, yeah, sorry. Jaybird? Yeah. Uh, wow, I, I, mean, I, guess I just betrayed true. our listeners. Oh, no. That's sort of a... a platformer i guess if just going by the strictest sense i mean i'm that. not i'm not i guess i was just thinking about games that are beforehand because like before soup like super mario brothers you had like pac-man i guess is a mascot for atari yeah. well, i'm just thinking like platformer games i'm sure they exist just i mean they're not as good though they're just not as good as mario yeah. that's what made yeah. mario so great right and you, i just yeah i just I don't remember any of them right nobody mm -hmm. remembers any of them um it's pretty much just mario and throughout the 80s and the early 90s there are other games that would try to capture that same magic uh, I think none of them really could, except for maybe Sonic the Hedgehog in the early 90s on the Sega Genesis. Um, and you should go back and listen to our episode on Console Wars if you want to learn mm -hmm. more about Sonic the Hedgehog, because uh, he was bigger than Mario at a certain point, um, which is pretty crazy to think about. Um, but besides Sonic, like there really weren't any other 2D platformers that ever gave the plumber a run for his money. So just laying a little bit of groundwork here in the 2D platformer space so that you know that by the time we get to the N64 and it's time for some 3D platformers, uh, Nintendo launched the N64 with a banger that would just change the face of video games and platforming games forever. I've often said uh, Super or Grand Theft Auto 3 is one of the most important and most influential games of all time. And I think the only other game uh, that could give it a run for its money in terms of like influencing modern games is probably Super Mario 64. One hundred percent. We got so many 3D platformers because of that. Yeah, and so many games that operate in 3D, even if they're not platformers, like they learned from Super Mario 64, right? Uh, just how to do games in 3D is is something that developers had not mastered before Super Mario 64, and after Super Mario 64, they got a lot better at it. 
because mm -hmm. it took that 2D side scrolling formula and it like brilliantly translated it to 3D and not in a like, hey, we took a 2D game and we made it 3D with like some polygons and a Z axis. Please give us your money. Um, but they took they did like a full on transformation that resulted in an entirely new genre that scratched the same itch as that 2D platformer genre. Um, and I think Nintendo were kind of the masters of this in those days from taking their franchises from 2D to 3D uh, because they didn't just think, how can we make this game? But in 3D, they thought, you know, what's the essence of this game? Why is it fun? Can we make the same kind of fun using 3D as like a tool to help us make more games that are fun like that, uh, which is a similar thought process, but actually really, really different from just like, how do we take this game and make it 3D? Um, and that's how we got Super Mario 64. And there were three I'm performers. What? Go ahead. Oh, sorry. My mind was just so blown by jumping into paintings. I mean, that yeah. that that was like what blew me away as a kid. Is that that's yeah. how they did the overworld? Is you would just run around and jump into paintings? I loved it. Yeah, and the the, the like ripple effect on the paintings mm -hmm. when you jumped in. That's, and you're like, it's so that still crazy looks good. looking. It does look good. Yeah. It looks good. Yeah. Um. So yeah, there were there were 3D platformers like before Mario 64. There was the Crash Bandicoot game, which was uh, affectionately referred to by its own creators, and I'm just quoting them when I say this. They called it Sonic's Ass Game. That's what they called it. And uh, uh, they basically just took a 2D platformer. They turned it 90 degrees counterclockwise and they called it a game. And it, don't get me wrong. Like Crash Bandicoot's very fun. Those games are great. I'm not knocking those games, but they definitely were more of an evolution on the formula of platformers than they were like a full on revolution in the way that Mario 64 was. Um, and I promise we'll get to Spyro here in a minute, but I really <laughs> wanted to set the. You got to set the stage. I mean, it's a build up to this for sure. Yeah, you got to You got to Everything has has its context. Right. And like part of why Spyro is is what it is, is because of the context of what came before it. Right. So um, all this to say is that while Mario was untouchable in the 2D days, uh, Nintendo, after they revolutionized the format in 3D, he became a little bit less dominant in the sense that like there were other games that were also pretty good. Right. Um, that's not to say that Mario fell off. I think some of, uh, or m all of the 3D games are good. None of them are bad games. Some are better than others, of course. Um, but the competition started to really catch up in the 3D area. Uh, Crash Bandicoot kept going on with uh, doing its thing with the style of 3D platformer it was working with, uh, which was, which again is a really good style, really fun. Um, and and uh, but I wouldn't consider them like open worlds in the same way that every single Mario 64 level was like an open world where you could just run around and do stuff. Um, they're kind of more like the three Bowser levels from Mario 64, which are very fun. Um, so those are some of the best levels in Mario 64 of the like, here's the start point, get to the yeah. end point. Um, and my favorite 3D platformer of all time, Super Mario 3D World, is that way also. All of those levels are like a linear, like get to mm -hmm. the end of the level, but in 3D thing. So I'm not knocking games here. I love that style. Um, but the open world 3D style was really uh, invented, I would say, by Nintendo with Super Mario 64 um, or you know, at least popularized and shown that it can be a good game. I'm sure there's like somebody out there who's gonna be like, actually, this game open world was before Mario 64. And that's fine. But you know, what you I remember, mean when I did that. you ever play Mario 64? And you accidentally got a different star than the one you were going for? And it just like blew your mind. Yeah, that happened to me as a kid so much. I was like, Whoa, I got this other star instead. There's more stars in here. There's so much more to do. And then it would like jump ahead and show you how many stars based on that one you grabbed. Ooh, yeah. Fun. Oh, good yeah. feeling. That's cool. And then you realize that every level had the same number of stars and it wasn't a surprise when you yeah. <laughs> like we're shown all the stars. You're like, oh, well, they all but have for that, eight stars or whatever. For that brief second, it felt so good, though, Tyler. OK. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, man. Mario 64. That, I really want to play that game again now. It has a PC port. They fully decompiled that game. And it's like got a, a real PC port that's not just emulation that has like all kinds of like modern features in video games. Um, that's really cool. They're doing it for Ocarina of Time. Also, there's a bunch of fan decompilation projects. I didn't mind the 3D 3D World or 3D All Stars. 3D All Stars, yeah, yeah, it was good. I, I know people knocked it, but I thought it was fun to play on Switch. I had a good time playing them. I still haven't beaten Sunshine though. I just played Galaxy and 64. I didn't beat Sunshine. Yeah, I think uh, Sunshine and Galaxy got like widescreen versions. Maybe Galaxy already had widescreen mode. Probably really did. It was on the Wii. Mm -hmm. um, but I think Sunshine got like a widescreen mode. I don't think they made Mario 64 widescreen, which is kind of a bummer. No, it was still like a square box. Thing. Yeah. Is it any different from just playing it on the Switch, the, the Nintendo 64 like expansion pack or whatever? I don't actually know if it is, if it's that different or not. Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, like I think the, the reason that I got it is because I wanted a physical copy of those three games. I thought it was cool yeah. to get a physical on a cart and stuff. So mm -hmm. that's why. And I, I think they, they did a limited run of those carts too. So mm -hmm. I, think, I think they're a little bit up in value now, which is why I, I so have <laughs> collectibles. Okay. I Not bought, I bought the digital version so that I wouldn't have to carry the cartridge around. And then I also bought the cartridge and never opened it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you, you have sealed. 
You have I've played those games that I've already bought three or four times. <laughs> Classic Whatever. gamer. What's another one? Uh, okay. So, okay. So let's let's get into 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 Spyro here. Are so we, we jumping are in finally? We're diving we're getting into, Spyro. into Spyro. There was a competitor in the '90s on the PlayStation that I'd argue did give Mario a run for his money in a similar style within that genre, and that is Spyro the Dragon. Um, love him. Love Spyro. We love Spyro on this show. Uh, the mid '90s were all about those mascot platformers, right? And Nintendo had theirs with Mario, Donkey Kong, Banjo Kazooie. Sega had theirs with Sar, so, so, with Sonic, with Sauron, uh, with Sauron. Yeah, <laughs> Sega had Sauron, so it's no wonder they they won the console war. I, in I think if Nintendo's. Sega actually full on went into Lord of the Rings IP, they would have won. Okay, you're that's probably my, right. That's, yeah. That's well, I don't know. Lord of the Rings wasn't as big back then. Before the movies, Lord of the Rings was a little bit so, kind of nerd nerd stuff. It was deep nerd stuff, but there was still like people would read the books though as a kid. Yeah. So you had that there. You know, yeah, you had if that. You read Lord of the Rings. You were a nerd. Okay, nerd. Tyler. Tyler just called me a nerd because I read it before nerd. the movies. Tyler just full on outed me as a nerd on our podcast. Everybody, okay. on this podcast we have about video game history. Mm -hmm. You're the nerd. Yeah, I'm the nerd. I'm the nerdy <laughs> one. Oh, there's Mike, the nerdy one. <laughs> That's what <people> say. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah so sega also had their mascot platformer they had sonic and his myriad woodland creature spinoffs like the knuckles games and there, there's a couple other like spinoffs in there um you know it's really sad though that the saturn never got like a proper sonic game in that era uh i'm just i, I think about that sometimes and i go man yeah that would have been good because the saturn technically could couldn't do 3d we've talked about the saturn at length already on the podcast but it would have been nice to get another Sonic game on it. Like I yeah, said, even a cool, like like the definitive greatest 2D Sonic game would have been awesome to have, mm -hmm. but it really just didn't have anything. It got re-releases of the first three Sonic games and like Sonic 3D Blast. Partially it. why it failed, probably. A yeah. big reason for big it. Reason one of the many it. reasons for its failure. Yep. Uh, <laughs> just one of many. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so Sega had theirs, but Sony was a newcomer to the space and they didn't have any existing IP off of which to build. Um, so Naughty Dog had brought them Crash Bandicoot in 1996, uh, which is great. But that game looked a little bit outdated uh, just weeks later by Mario 64. Um, still, Crash had a good thing going. The games were fun. They were selling, where, selling well. But the PlayStation could use a little bit more of a direct competitor. Enter the dragon and Dragonfly. That's kind of a Spyro <laughs> reference for you Spyro heads out there. Yeah. A later, a later Spyro reference. Uh, we will get into that game. Um, with his tiny little wings. Oh, he's so cute. He's such a cute little <laughs> cute little mascot. He's the I best. Know. Um, so before we get into the games proper, let's talk a little bit about the history leading up to them and their developer, Insomniac Games, who remain to this day an incredible developer uh, and one of my favorites, having not having developed not only just the Spyro trilogy, which I love, but also the Ratchet and Clank games, as well as Sunset Overdrive and Marvel's Spider-Man series, which, you know, Spider-Man 2 just came out like two weeks ago, so... Why um, is Spyro not in Spider-Man 2? That's the real thing. Or that's what we're asking today, right? That that's is the what thesis we're of this. I think the answer is uh, Naughty or uh, uh, Insomniac doesn't own Spyro the Dragon as a character. That's oh, the answer. Don't own, oh, that's yeah. that's lame. Or was Spyro ever in a Tony Hawk game? He feels like a character that might show up in a Tony Hawk game. He does. I don't think so. Because Spider-Man did. So I'm like, yeah, it's, that's kind of, that's an Activision thing because they had the license. To oh, they did. Yeah. I want what I'm trying to say is I want either Spyro to be in Spider-Man or a Tony Hawk game with Spyro. That's what I'm pushing yeah. on this podcast today. And also Neversoft had developed a, a Spider-Man game on the PlayStation. Oh, that's right. Because so, they didn't. My... It's Tony Hawk engine. It's yeah. The engine they used for Tony Hawk. So just pulling Spider-Man into that game was like. Super and that's cool. the one I played on 64 that I loved so much. Oh, great game. Mm -hmm. It really is a good game. I sh I'm going to go back and play that. I'm, I'm, I'm on a Spider-Man kick right now. Big into Spider-Man. Um. Okay, so, uh, oh, the Resistance series, also, Insomniac did. Eh, it wasn't bad, it was just kind of... Eh, that was, was a first-person shooter, right? Yeah, and it, it, I think on their own, they're fine games. I think they were just released at a time where everybody was putting out these gritty first-person shooters, uh, in, like the Brown Gary shooters in the mid to late 2000s, and I think it just, it was, just wasn't as good as the other things that were out there. You're describing it as Brown Gray shooters. It, 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 I know exactly what you mean. That's so yeah. funny that that's exactly... Everyone who lived in that era and played video games knows exactly what you're talking about. I played a lot of those games. Mm -hmm. That's partially why Uncharted, the series, was so... like. I was so excited for it and, and like, or, or I had so much fun with it was because it was like so bright and colorful. Yeah. To like Gears of War. And like, and that was just the style of the time. And like, there was a point where that was new and like cool and gritty. Um, it just kind of got ran into the ground a little bit by the end of that console generation, mm -hmm. I think. Um, 
So they were founded in 1994 as Extreme Software, which is really just the most 90s name possible. And it's also Extreme without the E, so it's just X-T-R-E-M-E. Wow. Just chugging Mountain Dew, shotgunning a Mountain Dew oh. on a skateboard, oh, making yeah. video games. Yep. Um, they renamed Insomniac Games in 1995 because there was some other software company called Extreme Games. Uh, or not games, but just like Extreme Software. And they were like, man. Eh. We're going to change our name. Again. Insomniac's a better name. It is. It's a better name. There were a couple other front runners in there. Um, I want to say Ice Nine was one of the. Uh... Oh, based on Kurt Vonnegut. Yeah, and they actually got wow. Kurt Vonnegut's uh, permission to that's do a, it. That's a deep cut from Cat's yeah. Cradle, if I remember correctly. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, they got that's they, crazy. They reached out to his estate then and, and like talked to him, and they got his permission to do it. Um, they ended up not doing it because. Uh, there was some other Ice Nine software developer company that was mm. using it without permission, but they were like, "Well, as they've already." Ooh, I already mean, they could have taken stuff. it and sued. Everyone loves a good lawsuit in America. Maybe they might have gotten sued, but it's a cool name. But I think Insomniac is still great. Yeah. So, uh, and Ice Nine would have been good, but yeah, yeah. Uh, they did make a, a game before the Spyro games. They made a, a first-person shooter called Disruptor in 1996, and so this is the early days of fps games this is just three years out from the first doom um and it was pretty decent by uh, by all accounts uh by the critics um but back then most fps games were not that great like doom's fun quake's fun uh, i mean look i know everybody has their favorites from that era but like they were not that great right mm -hmm. um at least in my opinion um especially console fps games because this was a playstation game so like Console FPSs were not good until Halo came out. That's like, I don't even know if that's a controversial opinion or not. Is that a hot take? Kind of, I think. I think, because, I mean, I would argue GoldenEye is a good game. I would not. Now, does it control so. well? No. But is it playable? Yes. No. The game runs like 10 so? frames per second. It's but, barely playable today. Oh, my gosh. We might be fighting right now. Oh, man. Are we exactly. fighting right now? When was the last time you played GoldenEye proper on Nintendo 64? Uh, not not recently, but I will do it right after this. I it, have it. I, I will boot it up right mode, after this. It's like 10 FPS. 10 FPS? It's that bad. It's I don't bad, I, just, dude. I just remember playing like because those those levels to me are iconic. Like like damn frigate. Um the the one in the statue park. The, I think it's just called statue, honestly. <laughs> but like those those single player levels train, like I remember those so well. Like definitely it was like good fun levels to play. When the timer starts turning on, you got to do your watch laser. Like that was like bringing up it, intense feelings. Oof. Tyler. Yeah. Tyler. Uh, I'm gonna, you know who I'm gonna talk to about this? Elise Snore, former guest of the podcast, because she wrote a book about wrote Golden Eye. And you're sitting here just Th burying it in the ground right now you just hey. trying to dig a grave for golden eye and i don't appreciate it that's my hot take of the episode golden eye not good this this might be like the same thing as my sora take to me <laughs> this is yeah maybe this is, this is hurtful right now you know what was good perfect dark was good perfect dark was very good that was maybe the like the best example of a good console fps before halo came out Thank you. Thank you for giving something. Give in me. Sure. Thank you for giving me a rare first person shooter game that you liked. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> not rare as in you can't find it, but the studio rare. Yeah. Um, yeah. And look, I've had fun playing Goldeneye. That doesn't mean it's good, though. I mean, yeah, I guess. I mean, there's a lot of video games that you could say that that I had fun playing it, but it doesn't mean it's good. It's not good. Yeah. yeah. You, I, you, you've been to, you've watched movies in the movie theater. Where you're like, that was really fun, but it's not a good movie. Yeah, it's true, I suppose. But I still, I will stand by Goldeneye. I will stand by it. Okay. You know? uh, all right. So we'll go back to Insomniac and Spyro now instead of our Goldeneye hot take. <laughs> instead, instead, of, instead of our two, our, our serious argument here. We <laughs> uh, so Disruptor reviewed well with critics, but sadly it did not sell very well. And it nearly bankrupted Insomniac, which would have been a huge bummer. And I kind of wonder how many studios like Insomniac we've maybe missed out on because their first game came out and it just like, just didn't sell very well and they like they went under and that's it and we never saw what mm -hmm. that studio could have done again um but luckily insomniac did not quit uh they did they did not go bankrupt um so we did get to see what they did do you um, want to see if disruptor has a co-op mod and we can play it together yeah it's probably going to be bad it's yeah i i don't I, I would bet that it doesn't. I don't think it's one of those games that's like beloved late years later that like it's there's just a, there's no a one enjoys it that like really puts together like a cool PC port of the game. Like I just don't think it's that kind There's of game. one Disruptor fan. Yeah. Like that person on Reddit that has all the Perfect Dark Zero merch. There's one person that's oh, like yeah. that for Disruptor. Man, 
I would love to get her on the show to talk about great. Perfect Dark Zero. I, w- I would love it. I mean, we already talked about it a bit one episode, but I would talk about it again. She's the expert. That that person mm-hmm. on on Reddit Game Collecting it shows up every once in a while with like she just tons of Perfect Dark Zero stuff, which is a choice, and I respect it. A strong choice, but we love yep. it here. If yep. you love something, we love that you love it. That's right. Um, so the team decided that a sequel to Disruptor would be doomed to the same fate, and they wanted to work on something completely fresh and new. Uh, and and like just go like go in a completely opposite direction. So ra- direction. So rather than make something violent like Disruptor, they opted for something a bit friendlier to the kids who were picking up the PlayStation at this point in time. Like there, this was starting to become like a console like kind of for kids. I think it got a little cheaper, um, and so parents were starting to pick it up for for their kids. Um, they had limited their audience to teens and adults with Disruptor, and they just wanted a wider range of people to be interested in their new game to maximize their chances of creating a hit. With families and i can respect that i think if you do one thing and it doesn't work out you can either say hey let's take the learnings we did from that and like try to basically do it again or say you know what let's not do that again let's do something completely different and just see what happens and uh, i think that worked out for insomniac here so Agreed. i'm happy with that yeah so that's how we get to spyro the dragon uh and we're just going to talk about the first game today we'll briefly touch on on the other two uh the ones developed by insomniac and then there's a bunch of other games that came out later um, that were not developed by Insomniac, they by a bunch of different developers, um, and they are of varying levels of quality. I'm sure the series has its fans and uh, and defenders uh, who will talk about the best games in the series, and then I'm sure there are bad games in the series that people will all agree is a bad game. I don't know. Uh, I'm just here to talk about Insomniac, not not the other Spyro games. So um, I think the the first three are the most important, and I think I haven't really played the other ones, so I can't definitively answer this but i assume they're the best in the series mm-hmm. and if you have a different opinion you think one of the later games is better than the first games i would love to hear it and you should send us an email yeah codex history podcast at gmail.com yeah. or the discord mailbag channel you know uh yeah so let's get to it finally the grime facts spyro the dragon developer insomniac games we already know that release date september 9th 1998 in north america that's um a few months after banjo kazooie came out so this is the timeline that we're in um it was released on the original playstation but i think the best way to play it these days is probably the reignited trilogy of remakes uh that came out just on every system ever um they're, they're yo just, um, you wrote every system known to man you have to say to that. Man. <laughs> <laughs> uh every like current system i should say uh i think they run they're, they're like ps4 uh, yeah Xbox and they, and they can play on all those then no problem i would yeah. probably get it on switch to be honest because then you could play it portably if you really mm-hmm. want to yep. play it that that's, way that's a good move uh it goes on sale on steam all the time too um which is also a great way to play it so or you know you can just play your legally purchased copy in an emulator that can speed up load times because the load times on those games are pretty yikes uh oh really correctly. they're really bad they're pretty bad yeah um they do a cool thing where the loading screens aren't just like a static thing they're like go through the portal and then spiral like starts flying to he's like he's flying to the next area and you're like he's flying for like a, a while and they're not really showing anything um so there's like disguised loading screens but once you know it's a loading screen you're like yeah this is kind of long i forgot that he does that and he's got those little tiny wings and they just shake back and forth he is yeah. like whoever the art designer is that designed spire the dragon was like i am aiming to make the cutest little dragon ever and they nailed it they really I crushed agree. it wholeheartedly that they mm-hmm. and he's got an attitude he's got kind of a tude you know mm-hmm. yeah love he's it got, he, he's a little bit younger he's around he's saving like the older uh dragon so he's got like that sort of like kid appeal of like the young kid is saving everybody you know kids always like those kinds of stories yeah so yeah he's a, so. He's a rude dude with a bad tude but a heart of gold that's right mm-hmm. that's right uh it sold five million copies as of 2007 um, it is a 3D platformer, and the average time on howlongtobeat.com to finish this game, about six hours. A lot <laughs> shorter than child me would have guessed. Oh my gosh, I think if I was a kid and you'd asked me how long video games took, I would have been like 40 hours. I would have just said a number that not, and been completely wrong. I'd be like, I probably spent 100 hours, 200 hours playing Banjo-Kazooie. Pretty long game. Like, now nah, you can beat that game in like six hours. <laughs> you can 100% that game in like six or seven hours. If you know, oh, yeah. you know, like if you know what you're doing, you can, yeah. Uh, and, and not just speedrunning. Like, I'm sure there's speedrunners that do it in an hour or something. But like, uh, yeah, this game's not super long. And none of the other ones are very long either. Um, but it is six hours of concentrated fun, if you ask me. No, all killer, no filler. That's, that's all gas, no breaks. Just Spyro the dragon. That's all right. All the way there. And uh, 
I won't, I want to talk about the Metacritic score yet. We'll, we'll touch on that later when we talk about the reception of the game. Okay. Um, so at this point, I'll give you a brief overview overview of the game itself if you're not familiar with Spyro the Dragon. So as you may have guessed, based on how we've been talking about this stuff this whole episode, Spyro the Dragon is a 3D platformer in the style of Super Mario 64. You play as Spyro, the titular dragon, as he saves the world going from level to level, collecting gems, items, and new moves along the way. Pretty standard stuff for 3D platformers, uh, but we were all totally stoked on this formula back in the day, right? Uh, this was super fun. Like it, it's pretty, it's one of those things like, you know, people say like, oh, Seinfeld today, if you watch it, it's not funny because it's like just cliches. Like Spyro the dragon invented those cliches. Spyro and Mario 64 invented those cliches of 3D platformers, right? Um, so uh, Mario 64 was barely two years old uh, and it needed a little bit of time to affect the industry because when it came out, it was like just just dropped. Everybody was like blown away by it, right? So like that that kind of like revolution in 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 uh, game development sort of takes a little bit of time to permeate through the the industry uh but by two years later it had it had done that i think um so uh spyro is like he's a little small dragon he's got to go to the different dragon home worlds there are five in the first game i believe um in the dragon kingdom and he's got to save a bunch of dragons from a bad guy whose name is nasty nork and i want to know great name who named that guy canonically who named that guy like in the universe uh is that like his legal birth name where I mean, is is Nasty Nork like is Nasty Nork a dragon also, or is he a different kind of? He is a half mythical gnome, beast. Half orc. He's oh, orc. really? So Nasty Nork. So that just kind of makes sense as far as the name goes. Maybe he gave that name to himself. Maybe. Uh, I don't know the deep lore of Spyro the Dragon, um, but I don't think we should be surprised that somebody who was literally named Nasty Nork turned out to be a bad guy. That's all. Mm -hmm. I'm Mm -hmm. uh, maybe if they named him Cool Carl instead, everything might have turned out differently, right? But then we wouldn't have a game. No, I guess you're right. We need that conflict. Yep. So, like any 3D platformer, it's all about going to different worlds and collecting those items. Gems, dragon eggs, dragons, you name it, you collect it in this game. Um, if it weren't released so closely to Banjo-Kazooie, so it was about six months out from Banjo-Kazooie, um, I'd say it was more heavily inspired by Banjo-Kazooie than by Mario 64, probably. I think Banjo-Kazooie was a great evolution on the Mario 64 formula, um, but started the 3D platformer trend of moving towards like just tons and tons and tons of collectibles, um, which was like Mario 64 wasn't really about that. It was just getting the stars, like do the thing, get the star. Um, Banjo-Kazooie was like, get the jiggies, get the notes, get the feathers, get the eggs, get the, <laughs> you know, get the, get all the things. And then in, in Banjo-Tooie is like even more stuff in it. Um, and like Jack and Daxter is full of that kind of stuff too. Um, so yeah, uh, he, he's got a few moves Spyro does. He's got like charging and fire breathing, um, as well as some traversal moves like gliding, which is similar to Kazooie's little flutter thing she'll do if you press A midair in Banjo-Kazooie, except for it never ends. It just, he just like slowly glides forever, um, which presented Ooh. some development challenges for the team, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, the story is pretty basic, but it's kind of all you need for a game like this, like Oh, nasty Nork imprisoned the dragons because he's mad at them because <laughs> they banished him from the kingdom for being a real jerk. And so he set up a sh set up shop in a place called Nasty's World. Uh, this is nasty smell spelled with a G also G N A S T Y. Important to know Nork. because he's a no man and an orc. It's, yeah, that's yeah. right. So nasty Nork um, and his world. Nasty's world is just a junkyard. It just it sucks. And he's he's mad about it because he was a real jerkus. And they banished him to his junkyard, and now he wants to get back at them. Which, hey, you know, I can't, I can't blame him. I can't blame him for being mad. He's got uh, a good motivation. It's a good supervillain origin story, right? He casts a spell over the whole world. He turns all the dragons across different worlds into stone. And Spyro is the only dragon unaffected by the spell. And he's got to travel to all those worlds to free the dragons, defeat the hordes of enemies that Nasty Nork has sent his way. And that's the story. And that's really all you need. And that's fine. Um, I will say... As for as simplistic as the story is, the game does have one advantage over any game on the N64 in its storytelling. Because the PlayStation uses CDs, there is a ton of room on the disc for voice acting. And nearly yeah. every cutscene in this game is voice acted. Like the, the, everything, it, it feels like. Like there's just tons of voice acting, which is pretty cool for a game in the 90s, right? Um, the worlds are large and expansive, um, which proved to be a bit of a challenge for Insomniac to develop because of Spyro's ability to glide through the air indefinitely. Um, technically, this ability to create large, expansive worlds was due to Alex Hastings' awesome engine that he developed for the PlayStation, which was experimenting with his new rendering technique at the time 
called level of detail rendering, uh, which basically all games use that today. Uh, it makes total sense when it's like explained to you. Uh, basically, LOD rendering renders things that are super far away from the camera at a lower detail. And then it sort of increases that detail as you get closer, which just makes sense nowadays. And you kind of, it's weird to think that there was a time where that wasn't a thing. But there was a time where that wasn't a thing. And this was one of the, the first engines that made use of that. Um, and that's how they were able to get like such large draw distances and, and bigger worlds was because you could get up on the highest point in a level and see so far out and all those things that were far away were not drawn at full quality because it doesn't make sense to draw them at full quality. When yeah, because in real life, if you look so far away, it's not like that detail. Just your eyes can't see that far. So, yeah. Right. Right. Perfect. So it makes sense. But in computer world, you got to tell the computer like, hey, don't make that thing so detailed when it's that far away. It doesn't make the computer doesn't know that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Computers so, like it needs to look perfect. Yeah. And then there's also like computing involved with figuring out, well, how far away is it? What level of detail do we render it at? And so there's probably some trade offs you got to make there. But I'm not a programmer. I don't know those kinds of trade offs. But that style of rendering makes sense. All games use it today. It's yeah. Like, you know, it's like, oh, it's just a, a basic thing that, that all games use. If you are um, a programmer, hit us up, Codex History Podcast at gmail.com. Yeah. If you're a game developer, you want to talk about some LOD rendering, just do Let it. Let us know. Um, because you got to remember at this time, uh, 3D rendering in real time was still kind of new in 1998. It was like, it wasn't, I don't want to say it's brand new, but it was like a little bit new, right? Still, Quake came out only a couple of years before. Um, so they had to be really, really mindful of efficiency. Um, and 3D rendering on the PlayStation hardware was tough, although it was possible, unlike on the Saturn, which I guess technically it was possible on the Saturn too, but it was like, it was pretty tough and pretty rough. Mm -hmm. um, but the PlayStation hardware was like pretty weak, especially compared to what we have today. Um, so I got this great quote from Alex Hastings about how the tech influenced the gameplay here. Um, so Alex Hastings says, Spyro can jump in the air and glide without any artificial timer restricting how far he can go. You could glide all the way across the level if you found a high enough point to start from. On the face of it, this, uh, this made the levels harder to design since Spyro's movement is so much less bounded. But it also gave Spyro something he could do that no other platformer could. It became possible to design levels with high peaks where the player was expected to look out across the entire level and spot a distant secret spot distant secret areas to glide to. This led to another subtle but important design decision. The, the sparkle of a gem in Spyro can be seen at any distance. Even if the gem is so far away that it would be smaller than a single pixel on your television screen, the game still draws a little lens flare sparkle over its position. This is because there are some gems that we really did intend you to fly halfway across the level to retrieve. That's cool. And that is really cool. And, and like a fun way to see how technology can drive gameplay, because I think those two things feed each other a lot, right? Like gameplay can drive technology if a developer wants to do a thing that's not possible. It's like, help me make this possible, right? But then also uh, a technical uh, uh, like achievement in a video game can also like say, hey, we can do this now. And then you show that to like the game designers and the designers go, oh, this gives me ideas, right? This is something I can work with. And then that is one of those things that I think being able to have those large levels like that gave them ideas of things they could do to work with that, which I think is really cool. So love to yeah, see that's amazing. forward. So about 80% of the game is written in assembly language, which is really, really hard to make games in, really hard to make anything in. Um, but it allows you to squeeze every ounce of efficiency from the hardware. Um, so the rest of the game is written in C, which is also very hard to use uh, and also pretty efficient. Uh, but it trades a little bit of efficiency for ease of use. And so um, I think it's probably some of the things that they maybe they weren't as worried about performance for they did in C because it's just easier to do that. Um, I can't even imagine doing anything in assembly really anymore. And I don't That's think games really do that anymore, especially because uh, you got games, lot, lots of games are multi-platform these days. So like when you write something in assembler, you're usually like whatever system you're writing it for is like, it's a very specific version, like type of assembler. I don't know exactly what I'm talking about here. Again, not a programmer. Um, but like when you make something for a specific console in assembly, you're I'm trying to remember is assembly the one where you actually write like it, the lines are like the actual, it's like memory. So you can only use so much. And if you need to go reference a line, you have to like physically write the reference number to go back. To it. yeah. It's like, it's very tedious, if I recall. <laughs> yeah, I think that is correct. I think it's extremely tedious because it just doesn't have all of the things that a modern language gives you mm -hmm. um, that make things easier, but like you sacrifice a little bit of efficiency for. And you should, like lots of times that efficiency is worth sacrificing for, especially these days where things are so complex. It's like you couldn't even do it in assembler. Yeah. Um, but 
So anyway, they use mostly assembly to do that. I think a lot of video games back in those days did that also because squeezing performance out of those machines was like really, really important. Not that it isn't important today, but I think the the ease of use sort of outshines the need to be extremely efficient these days. For sure. Uh, yeah. So yeah. But I want to talk about the music for a second, Mike. Ooh. Did you know that Stuart Copeland did the music for Spyro the Dragon? That is the drummer of the police ladies and gentlemen, of, of Sting and the police fame. So that's pretty cool. Uh, and he's very proud of this work. He said he'd write three songs a day, uh, for one for each world, which I don't think they ever ended up actually assigning specific worlds, specific songs. Um, but he that's when he was writing the music. That's sort of how he did it. Um, he played through the worlds. He used cheats so that he would not die while playing through the worlds. Um, and then he'd, uh, so he'd write three songs a day. And then the next day he'd sort of clean up and polish those songs. Um, he said the time constraints were tough, but ultimately the restrictions made him a better composer. And he still, to this day, talks about the work he did on Spyro and how it's some of his best compositions. Like he's I really, really proud of the work he did on Spyro. And the soundtrack, it kind of slaps, Mike. Like you go, you should go back and listen to this thing. It's really I will great. listen to it. I will listen to it while I play Goldeneye on N64. <laughs> there you despite go. Despite you. <laughs> yeah. There's another thing that the PlayStation had. Th th this was another thing that the PlayStation had over the N64 was that uh, the storage space of those of the CDs allowed for like a full on CD quality sound. Right? They didn't have to mm -hmm. use like MIDI instruments the way that like N64 music could be really really good, but it was all kind of MIDI stuff. None of it wasn't ever like full on uh, like sampled sounds um, or like a full on recording. Right? Waveform uh, and and. Spyro had that and lots of PlayStation games had that because they just had this, they had the space for it. Right. Yeah. So, I think that's pretty cool. I want to uh, listen to some Spyro after this though. I'm going to. Yeah. So soundtrack's great. Totally slaps. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how the game did when it finally came out. Did all these pieces graph together to form a great game? Well, I don't think we'd be here talking about it if that weren't the case because I'm not really into talking about bad games on this podcast. Yeah, we've we done it occasionally. Uh, Duke Nukem Forever. Yeah, we've yeah, done, we, it, a we've done it. We've done it, but uh, I'm not usually like there. there's like I, I guess I don't want to talk about uninteresting games, right? And lots of bad games are uninteresting. Duke Nukem Forever, bad game. Interesting though. Good to talk about. Yeah, good to talk about. Interesting during the game is not something I would describe it as. Well, I, the story of it, I think, is interesting. Yeah, the story of the development of it. But I mean, like, in-game stuff is, like, not very interesting, mm -hmm. which is one of the problems with it. Yeah, yeah, the game itself, not great. But, yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, it was uh, received really, really well as the PlayStation's response to uh, the recently re released Banjo-Kazooie. And while Banjo-Kazooie is my favorite game of all time, well, it's between that and Ocarina of Time, depending on, you know, what day of the week you ask me um spyro was like a really really great game that scratched that same itch for playstation gamers like if you were jealous of banjo kazooie and you only had a playstation pick up spyro the dragon you, you're you're not going to be disappointed right it's, mm -hmm. it's a, a game that sort of does the same thing uh while being its own game it's not like a i'm not don't mean to say that it's like some kind of banjo kazooie ripoff it's not it just sort of like scratches that same itch right um and I think it really helped fill that void on a PlayStation, on the PlayStation in a way that other games, like there was like Blasto and Medieval uh, that were like kind of trying to be that. Oh, platformer. Medieval. Gosh, yeah. I haven't heard that in so long. They were kind of trying to do the same thing. but they just, mm -hmm. uh, Medieval was really another talking. one on the what? demo disc. Medieval was another one on the demo disc that I played yeah. quite a bit at the beginning of, but never I finished. I played a lot of the Blasto demo and that game's not great either. Mm -hmm. Um uh, medieval i think just had kind of a re-release or remake or remaster recently maybe i haven't looked it up though i, I think it has like a, a a fan base of like people who are into it i don't think blast cult does. it's kind of cult classic blasto? thing does blasto no. ring any bells blasto rings nothing in my mind so yeah. crash was a great game too of course uh but it wasn't the same kind of game like you you wouldn't you wouldn't substitute crash for spyro the dragon they're different mm -hmm. they're different enough that i consider them kind of very different genres um it kind of did its own thing so critics did have some things to say about the controls which i kind of agree with the controls sometimes are not great they seem to fight you a little bit um the camera was not super great although some critics talked about how the camera was really good others were like this camera's bad i'm kind of more in the like looking back on it like how it compares to more modern games the camera like is kind of frustrating to work with. I think at the time, um, 3D platformers were still working out how to do good cameras, and Mario, even Mario 64 hadn't quite nailed it. Like, how many times did that camera get, like, stuck in a weird spot in Mario 64? Yeah. And you're, like, trying to move it, and you can't. And uh, it, Yeah. But Banjo was a little bit better, too, but... 
Yeah, I was going to say, none of the cameras in any of these like 90s 3D platformers were perfect by any means. <laughs> like They all had issues. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they were all kind of doing like trying to strike the balance between like giving the player control over the camera or making well also making sure the camera doesn't like go into weird angles is tough. And honestly, I'd say even today, like developers still kind of struggle with this sometimes. Um, there are some games where you're just like, gosh, this camera is awful, right? Um, so, you know, that's a hard one, hard problem to solve. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the legacy of Spider-Man. Legacy. Dragon. Well, there's a lot to talk, a lot more to talk about here than I think we can adequately cover in one episode. And maybe we'll do some episodes in the future of, of Spyro the Dragon. Um, Spyro's success with its first game would mean that Insomniac would go on to create two more sequels on the PlayStation, Spyro 2, Ripto's Rage, and then Spyro 3, Year of the Dragon, which came out in 2000, which is the actual Year of the Dragon, which I thought Ooh, was very cool. that was pretty cool. Um, these two games are very, very similar to the first. They're uh, further expanded in scope. The levels are bigger. bigger. They get more voice acting. Uh, Spyro gets more moves in them. Um, and the, the storyline, I think, probably gets a little bit better. Um, also has the addition of Tom Kenny, who voices uh, Spyro in 2 and 3. He did not voice Spyro in the first one. Tom Kenny is famous for being the voice actor for SpongeBob SquarePants and other characters oh, wow. uh, so he voiced spyro he voiced a couple other characters in the game as well i think uh this is probably the like universal because universal uh was publishing this game uh with naughty dog um and i think they probably were able to like pull the strings to get like good voice actors and probably somebody like Stuart copeland to do the um to do the music and that kind of stuff so um yeah there's a character in spyro 2 in one of the levels that sounds exactly like spongebob this is before SpongeBob came out. <laughs> I think it's funny, and and if you go back and play, re play that in the Reignited trilogy, where they re recorded voice, they used the original voice actors, but they re recorded it. He does not sound like SpongeBob anymore. It's it's uh, oh, they changed it. <laughs> it's just, it's still Tom Kenny, and he still sounds like the but same. They just made an effort. Thing, but, but yeah, there's SpongeBob, definitely yeah. a point in in that where you listen, you go, "That's just the SpongeBob voice. He's just doing the SpongeBob voice. <laughs> He's just doing SpongeBob." Yeah, which is uh, pretty funny, I think. Um. So, yeah, those games are great. Originally, I kind of thought we'd cover them here today. Uh, but, you know, this episode's getting we're running a little bit out of time. And to be honest, they're not all that different from the first game. They're bigger, they're better, they're expanded. They're worth playing if you like the first game, especially because none of these games are particularly very long. Uh, but it's all kind of the same. And that's fine because they, they had development cycles of like one year, right? Ripto's Rage came out in 1999. Year of the Dragon came out in 2000. So, man. They must have been just like, all right, this one's out. Starting the next one. Just yeah. boom, boom, boom. That's so busy. Yeah. And I think games are still like that today, except for they just they take a couple of years now. Mm -hmm. Longer development cycles. One, or less than a year of dev time, which was feasible in those days. And it's just not anymore. Like even Call of Duty, which puts out a game every year, like those games each have like two, three years of development. Mm -hmm. uh, they're just like on a staggered schedule. So um, that was kind of the, the style at the time and still the style today, I think. Uh, yeah. After Spyro, Insomniac, after the, the three Spyro games, I should say, Insomniac was done with their four-game contract with Universal, and they opted not to continue making Spyro games. Um, probably, they were probably just sick of it at that point, right? And they've been doing it for like five or six years straight. They probably didn't want to keep doing that. Um, but because this game was developed in partnership with Universal, uh, which, like I said, is probably how they got such great voice and music talent, um, Universal retained the rights to Spyro as a character, and they continued to make Spyro games with other developers. So there they was like part of their deal with Insomniac. They're like, we'll fund you and we'll publish this game for you, but Spyro's ours. And so Insomniac didn't get to like keep moving forward on that. No uh, Spyro and Spider-Man. That's why. Yep. Which I think is a, a lesson that they took into the future because their, their next uh, series of games, the Ratchet and Clank series, uh, they still own that character to this day, as far as I know, or at least maybe Sony does. Like, I don't think it's like with a third party rights holder, but. They, they at that point, they probably had built up their uh, ability as a developer to sort of be able to say, like, no, we want to own these characters, even if you're publishing this game, which they probably weren't able to do after releasing Disruptor uh, or or even before releasing Disruptor when they got into that deal with Universal. They, they didn't have the ability to be like, no, nah, we're keeping Spyro. Universal would have been like, cool, guess what? You're bankrupt now. Bye. <laughs> uh, so they kind of had to do what they had to do. Um, and that means that the Spyro games now are not developed by Insomniac. Um, so Spyro was a great game on its own. And I think I'd argue that it, uh, it itself didn't really do anything, especially new at the time. I think Banjo Kazooie was the better platformer. Uh, but what Spyro did have was charisma. And while I don't think he ever unseated Crash as kind of the de facto PlayStation mascot in the late, late 90s, I think he kind of took off in his own right. And certainly you might argue that today he's doing better than Crash is. Mm -hmm. Um, 
So like I said, Universal would go on to make a lot more spiral games based on the fact that he's a cute creature with massive appeal to children. Uh, the main series was continued on the PS2, Xbox, and GameCube with Enter the Dragonfly, A Hero's Tale, and Shadow Legacy, which was an RPG on the DS, which I think is kind of fun. I haven't checked it out. Spyro RPG? But... Yeah. I would try it. The DS had a had a couple of like weird RPGs uh, for games that aren't usually RPGs. There was a Sonic one too, Sonic Chronicles. Like Dark Brotherhood was like this weird oh. Sonic RPG on the DS. I remember hearing about that one though. Sonic Chronicles. That sounds I think it's pretty good too. I haven't never played it, but I think it's oh. pretty good. Yeah. So um then they uh they kind of soft rebooted the series with a with a new beginning. That's the name of the game, Spyro, a new beginning in 2006. And then there's another game, The Eternal Night and Dawn of the Dragon. There were also some Game Boy Advance spin-offs, Season of Ice and Season of Flame. Those are a few years earlier. Um, but none of the games past the Insomniac trilogy were highly regarded by critics. Uh, they may have been successful in that they sold be because they must have been successful because they just kept making games. Like I think kids just sort of get this stuff without uh, caring as much about quality as long as it's got the character they like in it. And hey, mm -hmm. we're, all, we're all guilty of getting stuff we don't care about the quality just because we like the character. Yeah, in, you know, for Isn't sure. Me? Especially when you're kids. Yeah. Um, and then in 2018, the first three games were fully remade in the Reignited Trilogy. Um, and I think that's definitely the best way to play them today. They look great. They retain a cool art style that like respects the the old style of the games while also looking very modern and and new. Um, and they re-recorded the voice lines. Uh, and they had Tom Kenny go back and actually do Spyro's voice for the first game because he was voiced by somebody else in the very first game. Um, so that's kind of cool. Um, yeah. And and yeah, they just redid all all the graphics. There's another sort of like side area that that Spiral plays in these days, which is the Skylander series of those like toys to life genre. I was going to ask about this because yeah. that is Spyro. Then that's the universe of Spyro He's, still. Yeah, I, as far as from the way, how I understand it, and again, this is not not within scope of this mm -hmm. episode to go deep here, but how I understand it is that Spyro is simply a character in the Skylanders series among many other characters. Maybe he's one of the more popular ones because he kind of. Uh, came from a previous IP and sort of already existed. And I think the first Skylanders game was a, was Spyro title. It was like Spyro something, something Skylanders. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, so, but he still remains part of that series today. That's like kind of the big thing. And I get, I guess those are really popular. Like I think kids really like, like those, or at least they did a few years ago. They kept maybe. making so many of them. Like I would see Skylanders like figurines everywhere. So like, yeah. every game store I went into. So I think they're, they must be popular. They must yeah. be a big deal. So, I mean, that's cool. I always yeah. looked at them as off-brand Amiibos. Is that messed yeah. up to say? That's kind of yeah, how I looked at them. It's probably safe to say. Um, but uh, yeah, he hasn't really starred in a game of his own since the Reignited trilogy in 2018. And so even before that, like since he had his own like original adventure. Um, but you know, I'm kind of okay with that. Spyro's a game I loved as a kid, especially the second one. That's the one I spent the most time with as a kid. Um, but I'm kind of okay with him not having any more games. You know, sometimes it's fine for a character to just... I'm not saying... I won't, don't want to say die. He just doesn't have any more games and that's okay yeah, it's it we have it's it's got a closure to it it's closed yep which is uh, fine for me the true continuation of 3d platforming was in insomniac's hands after this after spyro they created ratchet and clank uh which were gosh those are some great 3d platforming games and characters still to this day they have new games coming out still that insomniac uh makes like rift apart came out uh two or three years ago phenomenal game it's on pc now uh, came out uh, like a year ago, maybe on PC on Steam. Oh, so good. Uh, highly recommend it. Really, really good. Uh, great PlayStation 5. It was a good PlayStation 5 exclusive when it was exclusive. Um, I also love the Jack and Daxter series from Naughty Dog. They work very closely with Insomniac. And in those years, the Jack and Daxter and Ratchet and Clank years, they actually used a lot of the same technology, the same engine in uh, both of those series. Like they they helped each other out like they would. That's nice. I always yeah. like to hear development studios that are friends. Yeah. yeah, I thought that was cool. Like, they're not necessarily competing. Like, they are competing in the sense that they're in similar genres, but, like, I don't know. I feel like there's room for... I'll play Jack and Daxter and Ratchet and Clank. I don't need to pick a side. Yeah. They're, all, they're all great there's, games. There's plenty of time to play 3D platformers where you collect items. It's just a fun thing. Yeah. Speaking of which, and uh, decompilation projects uh, that we were talking about a little bit earlier, uh, the Jack and Daxter series has one of its own. The first game, fully playable on, on your PC uh, with a bunch of, you know, with modern PC game options. Um, and the Ooh. second one is in beta now, and I guess it runs pretty well with some bugs. And then I guess they'll work on the third one. So that's, that's really cool. cool. Yeah, yeah, this whole this whole thing of taking them and actually making them for PC, like proper PC versions is awesome. Yeah. And that's just done by fans. Like they're just yeah. friends, they're just fans doing the thing. And you you have to have a legally purchased ISO file of the original game so that it can it can 
extract the assets from it and all the things that are copyrighted. Fully but legal copies. Fully legal copies. Only. Yes. Um, and you can, I think you can actually like rip it off of the disc. I think PlayStation 2 games, you can just drop in your computer and rip it off the disc yourself. So. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Do you, do you have any further thoughts about Spyro? Any further feelings? Anything? Not really. I mean, I kind of want to, I, now I want to want to know if I did play the demo for the first game or like the second or the third game. Oh, because what I remember the most about it is you're in this like grassy kind of it's your standard starting area. You know, you're grassy, nice. There's a couple dragons in stone and you can like do stuff to get them out of stone and then it kind of ends. That's what I remember anyway. Okay. If they're dragons in stone, it's the first game. It's the first game. Okay, yeah, so I'm like pretty sure it was the first game. And I want to say I played it on the PlayStation one. It wasn't yeah. PS2, so that had to be it. But I, I, I love these. That one, it was uh, medieval. It was Spyro and then Siphon Filter was the other one Ooh. that I remember as being on this like demo disc that I had. So Man. demo discs is just a, a a thing that doesn't happen anymore. There's no it's, need it's there's no reason for it anymore. It There's still demos. There are demos. Yeah. Steam does demos, which is nice. And actually a lot of indie games do participate in making a demo because it's a good way to be like, no, look at what we've done. And it's like a good, mm -hmm. it's like people do play demos. Like I liked it and I'm going to download it, you know? So yeah. there's that, but. Yeah, they also have the uh, the trend of releasing a demo, but calling it the beta mm -hmm. uh, of, of yeah. games. So that if there are like problems, you can be like, well, it's beta. It's beta. Uh, Everything's fine. I kind of want to get the Reignited Trilogy when it goes on sale. That's what you've inspired me to do. I think it's after sort of I play my 10 frames a second, Goldeneye. <laughs> after I do that. Yeah. Yeah. Well. These games run. I don't <laughs> what know if I just come back switch. to you I just I just come back to you next week and I'm just crushed because you're right and I'm just like it does play at 10 frames per second I just can't stop crying yeah. <laughs> you ruined Pierce Brosnan for me <laughs> Ooh. I ruined Pierce Brosnan for you no so Pierce good. Brosnan ruined Pierce Brosnan for me yeah I thought he no. was an okay James Bond did he do something bad? I don't know much about no, Pierce no, Brosnan no no he didn't do anything bad I okay. think he was just kind of he was fine as goes. Bond his Bond movies themselves were like kind of mid, but I thought Goldeneye was good. I think Gold Goldeneye's Knight, good. Uh, but I your favorite role of his is in Mamma Mia, if I remember correctly, right? That's your favorite. Yes, role of specifically yes. Mamma Mia Two. Here we go again. Yes, yes, because he does when he sings, he is trying so hard, and he I love really it. is. He's trying <laughs> as hard as Russell Crowe tried in. Oh Lame my Ed. gosh, it was so great. Uh, uh, well, I. Yeah, I, I'm I'm excited. I want to try the the reignited trilogy. I think I'm going to do that now, and you've inspired me to do that, Tyler. So yeah. thank you. Also, the Crash Bandicoot Insane trilogy is a similar, uh, like re envisioning remake of the original games, original Crash games. Those that's all also very worth playing. Can I say another remake trilogy I'm excited for is the Tomb Raider ones Ooh. because I had that bugged out Tomb Raider three. I still have the game. I have the game still with me, but. I never got past a certain point. So now I want to like play it and figure it out and see what I did wrong and let mm -hmm. me go from there. But yeah, I'm excited. I, I, I love this. We should do more of these. Have we done Banjo Kazooie? I don't know. Well, part of me wants to say, of course we've done it. The other part of me is like, maybe I would never touch my sacred baby. Yeah, I know. I'll, I'll search it after the episode and let you yeah. know. Also, sure. we've been doing this for so long. I just can't remember. Dude, I repeat. I'm a repeat guy. Yeah. Do a Resident Evil repeat. Not I don't think we've done Banjo Kazooie, but that'd be a good one. Maybe I'll do that in the future. Mm -hmm. I have both copies on. I have the original copies on sixty four of Banjo Kazooie and Tui. Nice. I never spent very much time with Tui. Tui is a great name for it, though. I just love yeah. the name. I just love saying the name. It's fun. They call it that at the end of Banjo Kazooie. If you finish the game and get all the jiggies, there's like a kind of a secret cutscene, and Mumbo Jumbo's like, "Oh, well, we'll see you again in Banjo Tui." That's great. I love that they did that. I love that they knew. Yeah. And then well, there's a secret scene, I think, at the end of Banjo Tooie, where he talks about, "Well, see you again in Banjo 3. That never happened. <laughs> well, I uh, I want to do a what you've been playing real quick, and then we have an email to read. Okay, what you've been playing, Mike? So I've been obsessed with Return to Moria. I'm still playing mm -hmm. it. I it's funny because these survival crafting games don't normally do it for me, but for some mm -hmm. reason, this one because it's the IP that I like, I'm really invested in it, and I really love it. So I'm having a good time. Good. I got to Duero Delph. That's where I'm at, which I believe is the second to last area, just based on the maps that are available to look at. It's the second to last one. So, uh, but I fought, uh, I fought uh, the Watcher in the Water, like the from the first Fellowship of the Ring movie. Outside the doors is apparently in it. He actually goes, "There's another Watcher," is what he says. I'm like, I think they're just doing fan service to me, and it's working really well. Uh, <laughs> but I, I love that it's it's got some like good story beats to it, and I'm excited i did have a game bug 
that happened. You can you can tell me the ethics of this. Okay, this is what okay. happened to me. I made I got the recipe for a better backpack that fills up the full inventory slots. Mm-hmm. I made it. Tried to take my old pack, hang it on the wall of my house. Okay, mm-hmm. that didn't work. I swapped it with the new one. The new one disappeared, gone from the game. All the work of building it gone, which okay. was a lot of like rare materials. So what I did is I googled this. I found a world seed online of that has all the resources in it. And I put that on my file on my computer and I loaded in and I grabbed the materials again and I took it back to my old save, like my original game, and I rebuilt it to fix the bug. Do you think that's ethically sound? I think so in this case. I think if it's true, if it was truly a bug and not some like weird quirk, but ultimately inten- intended quirk, I think it's not cheating i think you're just working yeah, around i took i got the fine leather from this like seed game that had all the resources because the idea of return to moria i don't know if i've talked about this you jump from your friends games and your games and you keep the items so if your friend beat the game you could go get the best items from him and then take them back to your game that's in the game that's just a well part it, of it sounds like that's not cheating either way then Even yeah if so you weren't, weren't to fix a bug you were just doing what the game allows you to do to yeah. generate a new game a new world you go into that world the sketchy part was me just downloading the world save, I think. But yeah, like looking up. the And scene. I had to go into like the app data root folder of my my computer and drag and drop it in. And it showed up. It's called Pirate World is what it was called. <laughs> yeah, but, if you had to go like kind of outside of the game to like sort of do that. Like it gets a little bit gray, but ultimately. I, mean, I only grabbed the leather. leather. I just grabbed the leather I needed and I and I left because that's yeah. what I like the fine leather to make the big backpack because I was like, you know, I. I, I worked yeah. hard for this. I spent like a good 30 minutes on this. It feels bad getting punished because of a bug. So I think, yeah, it. I think ethically, assuming it's, it, it was a, truly a bug, like ethically you're totally in the clear. You're just like at the, the end state is that you got, you still have the backpack that got bugged away. Right. Yeah. And I no mean, harm, no foul, so, right. I think it will get a little bit more gray. If you start going into like and grabbing more worlds and like getting the perfect item. So you if can I go it. grab some black diamonds from that world and bring them back into mine, that's sketchy, you know, that's but, a little bit gray. Yeah. But also, as we've said on these we're hypothetical discussions, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I can it's cheat if I wanted there, to. Or you play with your friends like in co-op. There's no like competitive element to it. Yeah, really. it's it's really it yeah, and it's funny because sometimes the the orc enemies you fight are like potatoes, you know, they're just not they're just doing the same move. It's very telegraphed, very easy. Um, uh, but it's still just a fun, silly game, and I'm enjoying myself. And the story is actually doing really good fan service because you follow the fellowship. Like you mm-hmm. follow the path they took. So it's like really fun. But that's what I've been playing. What have you been playing, Tyler? I've been putting all my game time into Spider-Man 2 this week. Um, I'm just swinging through New York. I'm getting pretty close to the end of the story, I think. I'm like 60% on the the like how, how close are you to having done everything in this game. So um, I think I'm probably only two or three missions from the end if I had to make a guess. Uh, a lot of climactic stuff has happened thus far. Uh, but then I got to go back and I got to go to all the different districts and like, you know, go to all the spots on the map and beat up all the bad guys and solve all the puzzles and find all the spider bots and all that. Kind save of New York. Save New York. Right. You have to save New York. I have to save New York. So uh, I think I'm going to end up going for the platinum here. I'm going to look at whatever the after I finish the, uh, you know I I finish the story, uh, I'll, I'll go through and see if there are any hidden trophies that I don't know what they are. Uh, Because a lot of times, like, the story trophies are hidden trophies, so you get them, so that's fine. I just don't want to spoil myself. But if there are any that just seem like this isn't going to be fun to get, then I'll I'll abandon the Platinum. But I did get Platinum for Miles Morales, and uh, I would like to do it again for... I love it. Yeah, so... I love it. I love... I think if you shouldn't go for 100% achievements on every game, but if you love a game... That's when you go for it. That's where yeah. it like feels really good. I agree. I'm, and as long as it's going to be fun, like if there's going to be some achievement that's going to be like, uh, you need to have swung around New York for 10,000 hours straight without turning your console off. I'm like, I'm never going to get, I'm not, mm-hmm. that's not happening. Right. I've already decided because this return to Moria, I bought on the Epic game store. That's the only way to play it right now. If it comes to game pass for free, that's where I will a hundred percent achievements it. Uh, but as of right now, I'm just playing the game and having fun and enjoying. You don't care about Epic games achievements. Uh, Who who does? You can't even, you, you can't even click on the game to look at the achievement for the game. You have to go in a whole different section to find it. And it's like, it's not that great. And I also bug out all the time. I don't care that much, but I I am going to do it on Xbox because that's where it matters to me. That's where the gamer score is real. 
Yeah, gamer score is real on Xbox. All right. I'm about to. I think soon I'm going to play through Control, and I have it on Steam, but I believe Dude. it is also on Game Pass. You, you and I are like on the same wavelength here, apparently, because I was just looking up about Alan Wake and Control because yeah. they're all in the same universe technically, yeah. right? And I haven't played any of them. And Max Payne is in there too, although there's some weirdness because uh, Max Payne yeah. is in that universe. Yeah, in a in a technically he's like under a different name because like I think Rockstar owns a Max Payne IP. Oh. But, there's, but there's a character in the Alan Wake games that you're like, that's just Max Payne, but he has a different name. <laughs> there's a yeah, because there's a uh, a video I watched about it, and they showed the actor who plays Max Payne. And then his face, like the Max Payne face of like the, the photo that's all jumbled, like er, angry. Yeah. And then they showed him in Alan Wake too. And this is the same. And they're like, oh, okay. So I yeah. never played the Alan Wake game, the first one. I, I was recommended playing. by people I work with that I should just watch a video on the first game, play Control, maybe play the Alan Wake DLC, and then just skip to two. That okay. was the recommendation I got. I was going to play Alan Wake. I do have the original on Steam, not the remastered version, but I think mm -hmm. on PC, the original kind of holds up okay. Yeah, and the remastered version was just on sale for Halloween, and I missed it. But I was thinking yeah, Alan Wake might be a good Halloween game for next year. Ooh. But I also okay. want to play Silent Hill, so there's that as well. But yeah. anyway, we got it. We, we're we kind of going long. I'm going to read this email still. Do you want to go? You well, I was going to say uh, with Control, I've got it on Steam, but I believe it's also on Game Pass, and I'm debating whether I should play it on Steam for the Steam achievements or play it on Game Pass for the Xbox achievements. Mm. That's, that's where I was going with that. I don't know yet. And where do you, what do you think Gamer Score is only real if it's Xbox Gamer Score? So maybe that's how I feel about But that's also Gamer Score is only called Gamer Score on Xbox. That's just where I get the most achievements already. Most of my gaming history is on Xbox. Mm. I do have Steam achievements. I 100% Steam achievement Jurassic World Evolution 2. That happened. So there's that as well. I mean, I just wish Steam had the equivalent of like a gamer score, like a number, you know, mm -hmm. instead they give you those like trading cards. Yeah. And there's like, like, customizable you can see, like how rare your achievements are like, but yeah, there are some websites that will like take all of your, your trophies, your uh, Xbox achievements, your Steam achievements, like all of those platforms and like sort of aggregate it and like give you like an overall score of how gamer you yeah. are. Yeah, this is how gamer you are. Yeah, which is what I want to know. How gamer am I? How gamer are we? Yeah. Well, are we? Do you want to? Are we gamer? <laughs> the sign is vital. Okay, so <laughs> let's go ahead and read this email. This is a good email. This is from Eric from Futures Past, is what he says. Whoa! So Eric's time traveling here. Ooh, we got an X Men reference up in here. And the the subject line is Resident Evil. All uh, uh, with an exclamation point. And this is good because this is kind of like a fact checky kind of thing, which I liked. I like oh, people, people do this to us because I did get some things wrong about Resident Evil, specifically the differences between the remastered version I played and the original game. And Eric's going to take care of us. So here we go. Hey, Mike and Tyler, I'm trekking through your older episodes to get caught up. But once I saw the name of your latest, I couldn't help but give it a listen. I am a major horror movie and game fan, and the Resident Evil series holds a special place in my heart. I am proud of you, Mike. This is why we're reading the email for stepping into the spooky, even though it isn't really your thing. From what it sounds like, you played the remake that was originally made for the GameCube. I would debate that is not that, that this is a completely new game rather than just an upgrade look and feel. There are new areas and villains that were never seen in the original game similar to how the new Resident Evil 2 and 3 remakes are in comparison to the originals. If you struggled with playing this one, I definitely would not recommend playing the original then. Lol, <laughs> just a few clarifying points. Here's his like, clarifying points for the episode we did. In the original, there wasn't difficulties in the sense of easy, normal, hard, etc., but rather the two characters you could play as. Jill was the easy game, so that was in quotes, she had two more inventory slots and a lock pick and access to the grenade launcher. She may have even had access to more ammo and healing items, but I'm not 100% sure. Though Chris had less storage space and had to pick up a ton of small keys, in quotes, found throughout the mansion to unlock certain doors and drawers. And that mm -hmm. is very different than what I played because he had six inventory slots, Chris did, and there were a lot of keys but I could still play that on easy essentially. And he had more health apparently in the remake I played. It's a little different anyway, but uh, so next point by Eric though, Rebecca chambers is actually the last surviving member of the Bravo team, not the alpha team with Chris and Jill. I got that wrong. Tyler, Dang, Will you forgive man. me. I forgive you. 
Thank you. Resident Evil Zero goes deeper into her story and what happened to the Bravo team and leading into her arriving at the mansion. I know Mike commented on the confusion of the game naming conventions, but I'm sure Zero ha was named as such because it takes place before one. And I actually have Zero, so I might be able to play that, which is kind of nice. So next point, the later games, four, five, and six, begin to feel more action and less horror, though I'm not a big fan of five or six. They are a fun co-op games to play. Tyler, mm -hmm. I know you guys mentioned wanting to play Resident Evil co-op games. Also, Resident Evil Outbreak 1 and 2 were released on the PS2 and had functionality to be able to play online with friends. I think Resident, think, think Resident Evil X Left 4 Dead. That's what it's kind of like, those two games. Mm -hmm. Currently, it has been resurrected and can be accessed and played online on PC via a mod community. If you guys are down to try, I would love to jump in on it with you guys. Lol, that sounds awesome, Eric. Sorry for the long email. I bid you adieu, Eric from Futures Past. I love that. That's great, Eric. Thank you for Thanks, explaining Eric. the things that I got wrong because I didn't even write Rebecca's last name down because there was just so much information I was trying to get in this episode of Resident <laughs> Evil and I just forgot to write Rebecca's name down, last name down. So that's some really good corrections. I kind of want to know how much harder the original, original game was but I am going to take Eric's advice and not play it. Does that sound fair? I think yeah. it sounds fair because it seems like kind of a rough, a rough go. You could just watch a playthrough on YouTube. That's true. I should just do that. Maybe watch a Jill playthrough because I played as Chris and I want to see what I, what I missed, what bosses I missed or didn't miss or didn't, or what bosses I did that weren't in the original game is what it sounds like. So with that, I'm going to do our little social plugs here. Okay, Tyler. Okay. So I am making videos on TikTok and Instagram now of our episodes. So if you want to follow me on Instagram, I'm at me Coletta, the same as I am on Twitter. You're on Twitter at sneaker elf. Um, and I, I will tag Tyler in videos. He wants me to tag him in because I haven't cleared this with him first. So I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to dox Tyler, <laughs> uh, but we're putting videos up there. Also, if you want any more information on our podcast, codexpodcast.net is the best place to go for that because it has our discord link there it has a contact form and it also just has like our trello boards and everything else on there so i would recommend going to codexpodcast.net tyler would you like to say bye to everybody yes goodbye everybody <laughs>